you know, on, on, the, on their stove. So um, I am by no means a tea expert. So uh, I, you know, I think the tea is the starting point um, and, the, and the, the fermentation, both primary and secondary, are really where you get to sort of, you know, have kombucha become its, you know, what it's, what it's meant to be. That, that said, starting with good quality tea is important to get to the, to the finished product. So, um, mm. so, so a couple more. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, a couple more uh, tea questions since we're still talking about it. I think we talked about it, you talked about it a little bit. It was just like the difference between black tea and green tea. And I think not going down a rabbit hole of having to be a, a tea expert. Um, like for me, as it relates to kombucha brewing, the difference between black tea and green tea in my experience is that black tea creates like an end product that's a little bit stronger. And I think you said you used the word astringent, which I think is a good a good word. And that's why I choose to use the um, green tea, like the, the sencha tea, because it's a little bit lighter in flavor. It's, um, it's just, it's a more clean flavor and that's just my preference, but it doesn't mean one is right or wrong. Right. Yeah, exactly. It, it, I mean, it's just a flavor. It's a flavor. You know, some people use all black tea, but like I say, yeah, I find that to be, it's tannins is what, tannic acid is what makes that, makes us pucker. And it's the astringent tea. So by moderating by putting a, a lighter tea in like a green tea, um, mm. just like you said. And I, Sencha, is that, is that like the powdered green tea? I, I'm trying to, or is that matcha? No, green that's tea? the matcha. Yeah, no, this, it's just a, a type of green tea. Yeah, it's a, it's a loose leaf green tea. That's like a really clean, uh, really clean flavor. I, I like doing that. And it, this always comes up too. I always see this in different kombucha forums. And, and um, Nikki was asking about it here too, is Earl Grey. Earl Grey tea. Can you brew kombucha with it? Can you not? I've seen conflicting reports. I've never tried it. Um, so what I understand is that the Earl Grey has a flavoring, which is like a little bit of an oil in it. And that uh, could affect the health of the SCOBY. Then that's my, my understanding of it too. Um, now that said, if you've got a lot of SCOBYs, because if you make kombucha several times, as you know, it, the mother creates the baby and you've got another SCOBY. Um, feel free to experiment, you know, but just, you know, dedicate that SCOBY to playing around with herbal infusions or something with Earl Grey or something else, you know, coffee, you know, people play, play with coffee and make kombucha instead of tea as the base. So as long as you've got extra SCOBYs and you're not sort of ruining the, the, the mother SCOBY hotel, keeping that somewhat pure with, with just tea um, is what is wise. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned the SCOBY, we might be getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, but when you're talking about the SCOBY hotel, so like when you're making lots of kombucha, you have a SCOBY hotel that has a bunch of SCOBYs in it from your previous batches, but the SCOBYs like to eat particular things and they get used to eating particular things. So to your point is, so if I'm experimenting with black tea and Earl Grey tea and green tea, you're saying that um, when I'm keeping the scobies, maybe I should keep them separate because the scobies like they would like to eat the green tea versus the black tea and not really mix them up too much. Um, actually, I don't get that into it. What what I what I was just suggesting is let's say you're doing a coffee kombucha or an Earl Grey, something that's not quite just regular tea. Right. Um, that you'd probably want to to separate out. But again, I don't really mix my, my recipe that much. So my SCOBY hotel contains SCOBYs that are more or less eating the same recipe, which is 70 black, 30% green. Got it. But um, no, I wouldn't say within the tea world it's that important. It's just more if you're doing coffee or if you're doing herbal herbal teas only. And and honestly, there's a there's a shop in, um, in Northern California called Culture Pickle Shop, fantastic, brilliant wizards of, of kombucha and everything else. And they do uh, purely uh, herbal kombucha and it works. So they've got dedicated scobies. They'll put basil and flowers and stuff right in with the, the, the scoby without tea and, and make these amazing things. But what will happen is over time, after about two or three batches of doing that, the scoby will become malnourished in, in essence because, it, again, it needs the polyphenols and the things from that tea. So. Um, you can eat, sometimes you can bring it back and rescue it. Sometimes, you know, just let it go, compost it, feed it to the dogs, whatever. Um, it's called Cultured Pickle Shop in Berkeley, California is the name of it. I, I can see some of the, the, the chat questions. Cultured Pickle Shop, is that it? Cultured, yeah, with like a D at the end, yeah. Perfect, I um, mean, yeah, I just shared it there. 
Um, cool. Where are you at with the um, with the uh, kombucha? So uh, it's probably been about 10 minutes or so. Um, we can sort of use TV time and simulate that this has been sleeping for 30 minutes, but it hasn't. But um, OK. Well, just uh, Tom, be right back. Sure. Don't forget to throw your questions into the uh, into the chat as we as we go along. All right. So I'm gonna just fish my tea out of my tea bags. Yeah. What questions you guys have? Uh, other questions you guys have. So Fadi Fadi was asking. Maybe you want to clarify, Fadi. It says you don't put tea when the water is boiling. I think. If you want to clarify that question, just just type it in again. Um, but I think when when we talk about the temperature part of it is not necessarily um, the tea and the hot water, but it's the scoby not being able to be put into a hot water because the scoby doesn't like really hot waters. It just likes its lukewarm baths. And speaking, so, of, uh, so, I was going to say, speaking yeah. of temperature for um, for tea. Do you pay much attention? Because I know um, different teas have different brewing temperatures. So typically the black teas have like a higher brewing temperature, green teas a little bit lower, and then white teas even lower. Like when you're making kombucha, what sort of, how much of a focus do you put on that like time? Uh, very little. I just, I just boil it because it's mostly black tea. Now I know oh, this could be sacrilege to, to, to tea purists, and I, I apologize if that's the case. But since it's mostly black, I just boil it. And let it sit it let it cool down to you know it's probably about 150 uh fahrenheit right now um it just needs to be warmer yeah about 100 120 um fahrenheit in order to melt the sugar in order to dissolve the sugar so um but yeah if you're using an all green tea you could bring it down a notch or, or two uh because green tea doesn't require as hot of water to, to you don't want to bring it to a full boil again not a tea expert but um just what i've learned along the way so Mm -hmm. um, all right, so I'm ready to add sugar to my concentrate. So can, cool, are we all cool doing that? Yeah. So I've got, basically what I use is uh, cane sugar, which comes from the grass, the cane, the sugar cane. A lot of what we find in the world today is uh, made from sugar beets, which is a, a genetically modified product, which if, you're, if you want to avoid GMOs, then look for cane sugar, because it's not, to my knowledge, it's not, um, uh, GMO. So this is an organic cane sugar, and what I'm going to use is a is a cup per gallon, and that's 200 grams. So fortunately, I like to just use my kitchen scale for a lot of things, including this. So what I'll do is I will put my container on the scale, and then um, another principle, if you follow along, if any of my stories or, or videos is, I hate doing dishes. So I'm trying to find, I always find a way or two to cut out a dish. So we're avoiding using a measuring spoon or a measuring cup by using a kitchen scale. And I'll show you how I do that. So <laughs> That's cool. I've set the, the, the container of sugar on, set it to zero, and basically I'm going to pour out until I see a negative 200, which is a cup of sugar, or the amount that's needed for one gallon or four liters of uh, kombucha. I've never heard a kitchen hack like that. That's absolutely brilliant. We don't have a, a dishwasher, so I mean, I'm definitely going to be taking that kitchen hack up and thought it was great too. She says, yes, as few dishes as possible. <laughs> if I do write a book, it's going to be the combination of fermentation and, you know, how to be a lazy fermenter or something like that. It's, uh, <laughs> it's kind of what, what it's all about. All right. So here I am actually a little bit over 206 grams, not the end of the world, a little extra scoby chow. Um, and now I'm just going to stir the, uh, the concentrate to dissolve it. Again, this is still very hot because it was only doing it only brewed it a few minutes ago. So, uh, so Fadi was um, uh, clarifying the question about the temperature and tea, that sort of thing. So she said, when you add tea to the water, do you turn the heat off or do you keep the water boiling? I turn the heat off. So this is just this is just a pot because it's it's heat resistant. I'm not I'm not on a stove right now. So I will boil the water. Um, and then just pour it in, let the tea steep and, and cool down as it does that. Mm -hmm. Again, there's a thousand ways to make tea, I'm sure. So again, all I'm doing is just stirring to dissolve the sugar so I don't see the crystals anymore. 
Have you experimented with different sugars and sweeteners, like just specifically in the first fermentation? Because we had some questions yesterday too about um, agave syrup and different like sweeteners and sugars. And I, I was just sharing my experience. Like I've experimented with just regular white sugar that you get from the grocery store, organic cane sugar, coconut sugar, palm sugar. Um, and they all have different kind of properties and I've made kombucha with them and some have tasted good and some just did not taste good at all. So it was more just a mm -hmm. matter of taste preference, but not necessarily um, performance. Like it's still made kombucha, but I never, I, I haven't used like a, a sweetener, or like a, um, a sugar substitute, I guess, which is what, what Stevie is. Like what's your experience with different sugars and sweeteners in the first fermentation? So again, this is one of these areas where I'm a bit of a purist. I like I like sucrose because SCOBY likes sucrose. So sucrose is table sugar molecule. It's one, one part glucose, one part fructose connected by a bond. That's what sucrose is. That's the easiest for the SCOBY to start to digest. So what happens is it takes that sucrose um, and the yeast that go to work, they break that bond. And so they make, they break, they make simpler sugars. They've got, you've now got a glucose and a fructose molecule at w after which the bacteria, because remember this is a symbiotic culture of yeast and bacteria working together, then can start to consume the glucose and that's what forms the mat, the layer, the cellulose, the new SCOBY. So um, if they love using tables, just table sugar, white sucrose, pure as possible, then that's, what's, then that's what I'll, I will use. So um, different sugars, as you mentioned, probably have different you know, gr gradients of minerals and maybe different uh, ratios of, of fructose and glucose uh, to sucrose. In fact, honey, which is a diff, we can talk about a honey kombucha is a little bit of a different animal, but honey has a different uh, structure than, than just table sugar. So um, as long as I think it has sucrose in it for, to feed the SCOBY so that the, the organisms can basically, it's their raw input, it's their raw material, mm -hmm. then, it, then it should work. Now things like stevia, I'm not sure about stevia, but things like aspartame and fake sweeteners, they can trick our mammalian brain, but they don't fool the SCOBY. They don't fool the yeast. The yeast looks at it and says, what are you doing? This is, this is not sugar, you know? So um, they can't be fooled the way that we can sometimes with the artificial food. Mm. Um, an awesome reference book is The Big Book of Kombucha written by Hannah Crom. She, has, she breaks down all the different um, sugar and sugar substitutes and kind of has like, this is great this is okay, don't use this, kind of like that. So uh, The Big Book of Kombucha by Hannah Crum, C-R-U-M. Yeah, I just put that in. That's and a great, actually that, go ahead, yeah. I'm just going to say that's a great kombucha Bible, let's say, just a good starting point. And it's, um, oh shoot, looks, it says my connection is unstable. I don't know if I'm, I'll be fading in and out, but back in 2011, the same year I started the Mentors Club, I also went up to Los Angeles, which is where Hannah's based, and took my very first kombucha workshop from her. So, um, and she's gone on to write this amazing book. She also has founded Kombucha Brewers International, which is a, basically a trade association for companies that brew kombucha professionally. Basically in order to educate the world about, hey, kombucha is not beer. Because right now we're in a regulatory environment where a lot of governments like, oh, it's alcoholic and they sort of regulate it like, like booze and it's not, right, as we all know. It's got trace amounts of alcohol, but it should be regulated the same way that beer is. So, um, Hannah Crom, C R U M. Um, Perfect. Yeah, I put, I, put yeah in, I put it in the chat there so people can find it. Um, Fadi was saying sometimes she uses date palm extract and it makes kombucha taste really nice. So, there you go. I think oh. at the end of the day, like you said, experiment, try it. Like, not, it's not going to harm you at the end of the day. That's the best part about experimenting with kombucha. Um, you can experiment. <laughs> it might work, it might not, but it's just, you kind of taste it along the way. And if you like it, continue on. If you don't like it, then scrap the recipe and, uh, and move on. Um, Emily was asking too, what's the ratio of hot water and sugar? And it's not really, I mean, I'll let you comment on that, Austin, but it's not really a ratio of the hot water and sugar in what he's making. It's think of it as like, we're brewing a big batch and this is a concentrate that we're doing right now. So this is for one gallon. For one gallon, four liters. So as you can, I don't know if it's maybe hard to see, but all the sugar is, is, is gone. So now we've got the super concentrated tea concentrate. And now basically what I want to do, but if we added the, if we just added the SCOBY to this now, it would scald it because as just as a reminder, 
cooking food is designed to kill bacteria. That's why we cook food. So if we in, in, introduce something that has bacteria, which in this case, the SCOBY, um, and cooked it at 140 Fahrenheit, it would kill everything. So we need to cool the tea down before we add the SCOBY. So the concentrate method, one fourth or one liter concentrate, and now the other three fourths of cool water. So as soon as I add this, uh, the tea will be ready. It'll be at the right ratio. And now we can use this to uh, brew kombucha. So now we don't have to wait around for a gallon or four liters of, of tea to cool. So I have to tell you, our first, the first like six or seven times I made kombucha, um, I didn't know that little hack of the concentrate method. So I'd just be brewing it like gallon by gallon. So I'd like brew the tea on Monday and then I'd have to wait until Tuesday for it to like finally mm. cool down. And it was, it's, it worked out, but it just makes more sense that you can kind of complete the process in like a 20 minute period versus a 24 hour period. Right, exactly, exactly. Uh, all right, cool. So I'm going to now add this to the fermenting vessel. And for me, I like to use a, this is basically a, a ceramic water dispenser. Um, it's to about 2.25 gallons. And if you can envision taking one of those glass bottles and putting it on top, that's basically what this is, it's just a water dispenser. So it works great because it's <coughs> opaque, it's ceramic, it's non-porous and it's wide. So the SCOBY likes a lot of real estate, as I like to say, think Texas, not Manhattan. So like you want, you want it to be wide and so that the SCOBY, the new pellicle that forms, has a lot of place, in place to grow. So this happens to be, make a great vessel for that. Um, I often find them, uh, you can get them used uh, cheaply because people don't know yet that you can make kombucha in them. So get them for like five or 10 bucks. Or I actually also sell these on my website with the full kit. So you get everything you need to make kombucha. It's got a thermometer strip, it's got the spigot, it's got the egg and all that stuff. So I'll try not to be too spammy, too infomercially here, but um, that is one of the things I do, I do sell. So all right, I'm basically just gonna pour um, the tea into the container, making sure first that the spigot is closed because I've done that before where I have forgotten that part. So. Um, I got my tea in there. And the next step is that before we have the SCOBY is we want to make sure that the pH is at a safe level. Did you, I don't know if you guys talked about this. Uh, yesterday no, we didn't, or, get into, we didn't get into pH um, really talking about that at all. We just kind of, we got it to a point where it was um, that it would like exactly where you were. And then we had a, um, a culture and some starter um, added to it. Okay. Um, how much time do we have, by the way? Are we, what's our... We're about like, we're half an hour into it. We, I, we blocked off three to four, like, well, three to four Eastern. So about 30 minutes okay. ago. Good, great. All right. So, um, so we've, got our, we've got our tea in here. It's cool. It's ready to go. But the pH, so let's talk a little bit about pH. So pH is a measure, generally is a measure of acidity. It means the number of hydrogen atoms in a particular solution. And the, the safe pH that we need kombucha to start at is 4.6. So um, fortunately or unfortunately, tea, when we just brew this, has a pH of about five. So what happens is as things ferment, they become more acidic and the pH drops, which is what we want. That's what makes it safe. That's what keeps out pathogens and molds and things like that. So if we just added this kombucha scoby to tea with a pH of five, it's borderline. You know, it may, if you're in a hot, on a hot day or if you caught an extra airborne yeast or mold and it gets to the party, it can basically threaten the safety of the brew. So uh, the easy fix for that is to use mature kombucha or sometimes called starter fluid or starter liquid. So uh, uh, that's what I've got here. This is the kombucha that I made from a previous batch. And all we really need, uh, the way pH works, again, I'm not, no mathematician, but it's logarithmic. So a little bit of a low pH, liquid added to a larger volume of higher pH liquid brings the pH down quickly. So when we add just one cup, uh, two, is that 250 mils? I'm, I'm working, on my, yeah. working on my metric system. Um, That's right. To what, to four liters, basically, that will bring the pH down to the safe level where it's safe to add the scope. So that's all I'm gonna do, add about a cup of mature kombucha. 
and now we're ready to add the SCOBY. So this is, this is a SCOBY. This is actually, I have friends, friends in high places that run kombucha companies and they will give me a SCOBY that's like this big because they're doing it in giant quantities. And um, that I can then, you can cut it up and hack it up. And as long as the, the size of the SCOBY is, uh, is good, then it'll work in a smaller batch. So um, ready to take my SCOBY. Do you, ever, do you ever weigh your SCOBY? Austin, or is it just kind of just by, by eye? Because I know that when we were, when I was kind of just getting serious about replicating the recipe over and over again, um, I, I definitely noticed that when we had a thicker SCOBY I added, it was way more acidic. And then if I, the other batch that I had was like a thinner SCOBY and it was a lot lighter in flavor. It almost was like the bigger SCOBY fermented it um, faster. So then we finally found the, the right number of grams. And this is like, really perfecting your kombucha. It's not that important when you're just starting out, but when you're kind of tracking it, um, I notice that there's a difference. Yeah, um, I mean, the minimum that I, a size that I would recommend is four ounces, whatever that is, 125 grams mm -hmm. per, per gallon at a time. So if you're just like, say you're buying or purchasing a SCOBY, that's usually the size you're gonna get, and then you'll get your cup of starter liquids. So, um, but anything beyond that is fine. Bigger is fine. Smaller just means it might take a lot longer um, and just be frustrating for you and the SCOBY because it's got you've given it too much work to do. So just size it okay. Bigger is oh, bigger than what you need is okay. Smaller is again a little bit more, a little bit more frustrating. But um, so this is again probably a chunk. This is probably eight ounces. So again, maybe more than I need. And it's interesting because I haven't done the measurements, maybe the experiments you have where um, using a larger SCOBY translates to faster fermentation time. It's, it's possible because you're, you've got more starting organisms and hmm. equal amount of food for it. Um, I guess I just never really experimented with it because maybe that's just my, my the, eth the ethos of fermentation is it's not supposed to be fast. It's supposed to be happening at the speed of nature. So. So I just, I guess I never questioned it or was never that curious about speeding things up. It's mm -hmm. just gonna happen as it happens. So um, anyway, it's about eight ounces. You can handle the SCOBY with your hands if they're clean. And I recommend, this is a vinegar spray, something that's slightly acidic to put right on your hands before you, if you're gonna handle the SCOBY directly because uh, the pH of our hands is probably higher than what the SCOBY likes. So you're gonna have to do that. Um, if you don't have tongs or you just wanna play with your SCOBY, sit by your hands first and I'll <laughs> keep it G-rated. Hmm? Let's keep it G-rated with the playing with the Scobies. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. This is a family show. All right. So that's pretty much it. Um, now all I need to do is cover this up because, but something, something that's not airtight, right? The process, processes of kombucha fermentation are both aerobic, meaning with air and anaerobic at different stages of, of the brew. So we want to uh, make sure the yeast breathe, which are breathing air now, can do their thing, start to break down that sucrose bond. Then the bacteria will pick up the glucose, form a layer. And then after that, the underneath the brew becomes an anaerobic environment. So this is actually a strategy these, these brilliant microbes have come up with over the years. Um, and then once there's less oxygen underneath the brew, when that seal has formed, the yeast then switch to fermentation. And so what that means is, they are now producing ethanol, and that's what alcohol, that's another word for alcohol. So then they, they take the sugars, they're converting things into ethanol, and then the bacteria take that ethanol and break it down into these organic acids. So that's the sort of the cascade, if you will, or the, the sequence of, of what's happening at, in, in the crock uh, at mm -hmm. the microbial level. It's, to me, it's like utterly fascinating that these organisms, which are a hundred, you know, one of them is a hundred times larger than the other ones. So it's not like they're just, you know, hanging out. It's like, you know, like an, an ant and an elephant working together to, to do something, you know, it's like, it's fascinating. But anyway, you know, you get geek out on that too much. <laughs> no, that's great. That's, that's cool. So, you, uh, uh, so I, I had a couple of questions about the, um, just kind of the stages where we're at too. And there's a couple more questions in the chat that I'll, I'll get course, to. Um, Gabby, can you just clarify your question too? I wasn't sure on that one. Um, so as you're, well, two things. One, you mentioned the temperature strip. Um, so talk to me about like temperature of like the first fermentation. And then also when you're talking about um, 
that ceramic jar. So just so you know too, I put a post, everybody, I put a link up in the chat. You could link to um, Austin's website there if you want to take a look at the ceramic kombucha kit. Um, but you mentioned opaqueness. And so like we're brewing ours in a, um, a glass jar. Um, you, you were talking about opaque, which is important. So can you just talk about like the light and then also like temperature for when you just, um, for the next like few days while it's fermenting? Absolutely, yeah. So, so opaque because um, sometimes UV light, ultraviolet light, which comes from the sun, can damage or alter, you know, certain microbial fermentations and activity. It's not the end of the world if you, you know, if, if I had a glass container in this room, which is fairly bright, I would still do it. You can always just drape a towel or something over it if you're that concerned. Just avoid putting it like in a sunny window because that's, again, you just, you don't want to do things that threaten the chance of success. So um, that said, I can tell you stories where I thought I'd killed the scoby on purpose and that sucker came back like, you know, weeks later. So um, it's a, it's a hardy, resilient culture. But again, if you're starting out, just eliminate all the variables that can mess you up and, and you'll have success. So that's as far as light. Um, temperature range, the ideal temperature range for brewing kombucha is 72 to 84 Fahrenheit, which I'm gonna cheat here, 22 to 29 Celsius is, is the sweet spot. Um, if you go too far below that, then the activity just doesn't, happen it just it, it's very slow so what should take two maybe three weeks might never happen at all um, and if it's too warm you could be on the other end of inviting other microbial beasts like molds and stuff so uh, good to keep it within that temperature range and everything should be happy cool and then one more about um so i think that answered your question there morris and he did mention and maybe you just want to talk about this too um Austin, yeah, I mean, Anne asked about the winter too. So like in Canada, it gets down to minus 30 um, Celsius, which is just minus freezing cold in Fahrenheit. And it gets really cold. So where do you put your kombucha? And then what are the alternatives? Because like some people are suggesting heat blankets and that sort of thing to, to wrap them in. So maybe chat about that. And then also, um, so just one more on temperature. And then someone was asking about the SCOBY and starter liquid. Like, have you ever made kombucha without using a SCOBY and only added the starter liquid? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, so great question about how to keep uh, SCOBY warm out or kombucha warm out of season. Uh, I, a heating blanket is gonna to be too high. Like the, it's, gonna be, it's gonna be way too above that, that range. So I've recently discovered a seedling mat, which is basically, it's a rubber mat that's got a very low wattage heating element through it. And it's designed to help sprout seeds in cool weather, right? So before it's time to plant your, your seeds, you wanna make them inc kind of incubate them. Um, so actually that's what I've, I've got a couple of variations. So they're very inexpensive, you know, for a 10 by 20 inch mat. I don't know if it's maybe hard to see, let's see if I can. I just, I popped a link up in the, um, the chat there too. I just found one on Amazon. I just saw there. It's like a 10 yeah, by 20 so inch and it's 20, $26. Yeah, very inexpensive. You can kind of see that's what this is here. So what I'll do is I'll just roll out that mat. It's again, it's rubberized, it's waterproof, it's really makes conducive for kombucha. And then just set my bottles or my crock on top of that. And that's gonna give, it's gonna raise the temperature by about 10 degrees Fahrenheit. So whether that's enough for in, in, in extreme uh, environments like where you guys are, I don't know. So you may wanna get creative. Another thing I've done is directly behind me is, um, this is a, a brewer's bucket, six gallon brewer's bucket with a larger seedling mat that I just enveloped around it. So this is like a 20 by 48 inch uh, that's actually wrapped all the way around. So this is this creates another environment that's pretty warm. And this also has, uh, you can get fancy and get these uh, temperature gauges. So what this does is it cycles the power on when the temperature drops down below. So the cheap ones that are you know 10 bucks, 15 bucks, they're just always on. The ones that have controllers on them, you can say, okay, I want this to be at 78 Fahrenheit, and then it'll cycle on as it needs to. So really foolproof way to, to keep stuff um, going. Now, here in Southern California, it's starting to warm up. This, this is probably not super necessary, but kind of, I've kind of gotten used to it. Like I like the, the predictability of like, hey, it's 78 degrees for 14 days. I know what's going to happen. So um, whereas, you know, spring can always be a little bit, you know, it can be hot one day and cold the other day. So 
Um, another seedling mats are just a revelation because um, they're cheap, they're waterproof, they work well, and they they get you right into that into that proper range. So that's what I'd recommend. Cool. And the other question was about the um, SCOBY and starter liquid. Have you ever made kombucha with just starter liquid? No, it's on its own. Um, I haven't, but I know it's fairly straightforward. So to do that, you would purchase a uh, commercial kombucha that's just a uh, plain. So find one that just doesn't have any flavors, original or plain. And then that has enough ambient bacteria and yeast in it to eventually uh, make a new SCOBY. So you would treat that bottle, let's say it's a pint, uh, like it's like it's the SCOBY, feed it more tea, and then you will slowly see, usually it takes about in four or five weeks, and then you will see the new pellicle form. So um, that's, again, I haven't tried that too many times, but my understanding is that's that's how you would grow your own SCOBY. And have you ever made, have you ever made kombucha without SCOBY and just made it with literally just the starter liquid? So added like your cup or two cups of starter liquid, but did not add an actual um it's like the cellulose scoby part i've i've never done that i i don't okay. know if that would work um yeah you know, that was one of the questions just uh, if, if you've ever done that before and if, if you could actually do it I've, I've never done that either i've always added the scoby in there and um i now that i'm attached to the scobies i couldn't imagine making kombucha without a scoby i feel like it's a a part of the experience it, it is and and and, and in, at least with other ferments um I, I know this with kefir, which is uh, it's just, it's also a scoby, but it it it, uh, it makes turns dairy, it turns milk into kefir, which is like kind of a yogurty drink. Um, they've shown that, um, and then you can't just take you can't it's called backslop. You can't just backslop kefir into milk and make more kefir. Whereas you can with other styles of like Bulgarian yogurt, you just take finished yogurt, slop backslop it in, and there's enough ambient. Um, microbes in, in that batch. The reason is because certain uh, bacteria and certain chemicals or, or molecules are only found on the SCOBY. So in the case of um, uh, kefir, certain, certain microbes were, they studied, they, they saw them on the, on the grain, on the SCOBY, but not in the finished beverage. So that's how they concluded. And obviously those were integral to making the, the, the kefir. So my, I'm guessing that might something analog, analogous might be this true for um, kombucha, where there's something that resides only in the SCOBY that's helpful in doing the metabolism. So if it's not there, it's just gonna be a lot harder to do. So long-winded pseudo-scientific explanation, but that's what I <laughs> That's cool, that's great. So we've got, we've got about 15 minutes to go and then we'll um, wrap up. Um, there was a couple questions um, also just about like, I guess if you wanna just like finish up, put the top on that sort of thing and then um, Maybe we can talk about looking at second fermentation because there were some questions. Oh, yeah. uh, and we'll just finish with second fermentation. Some questions around carbonation, which is always a big, uh, oh, yes. big question for people. The hot topic. They're, they're bubbly, bubbly kombucha. So one of the questions was just, what's the secret to great carbonation from Anne? And then also just does yeast affect it? Like the amount of yeast and that sort of thing. Um, and how do you get good carbonation? And um, and Jean was asking on Facebook also, like we talked a little bit about the teas, but we were also talking about uh, SCOBY hotels. So let's talk, right. about, let's talk about getting some bubbles and then um, maybe just talk quickly about a healthy SCOBY hotel and like what size of vessel, like how much tea, how much starter do you need it, that sort of thing. Yeah, you got it. All right, so uh, I'm gonna do a real quick and dirty uh, secondary fermentation. And I'm going to use a fruit called a loquat. Um, I believe in Europe it is called, a, or in Spanish, a, a nis, nispero, nispero. So if that loquat doesn't mean anything to you, it's a, it's a cool fruit that only uh, fruits in like April, May. So my tree outside is like, he, branches are heavy with this stuff. So it's a one time of year thing. You got to use it quick. It's, it's kind of tastes like a cross between a pear and a, I don't know, uh, a peach maybe, a, or just, it's, it's kind of a mild, like an Asian pear, it kind of reminds me of that. But anyway, what I'm doing is I'm using it as a sugar source to do a secondary fermentation. So what do we do when the kombucha is more or less ready to drink after our primary, 14 days or so, we can then decide to add it to a bottle. 
and then um, do a secondary fermentation. And the goals of doing that are to infuse new flavors as well as to build carbonation, right? So remember we talked about the um, SCOBY forms a seal around on, in the primary fermentation. So if, you, if you're dispensing your kombucha from the primary fermentation and you see those little bubbles, bonus, you get extra kombucha points because the, um, it just means there's carbonation that builds up under that, under the layer, but eventually it'll, it'll, it can bubble out. So uh, the real place that we make carbonation on purpose is in the secondary. So to do that, we take a fruit source or a sugar source. I like to use just straight up sliced fruit. You could certainly use um, pureed fruit or pre-made pasteurized fruit juices, and just gonna take a couple pieces of this and add it to a bottle. Um, and the bottle that I'm using is a, it's a beer, it's like a beer brewing bottle and it's got this, this lid called a swing top lid or a glolch, sometimes you'll see it. And that is a key to carbonation. You need to have a tight seal during secondary fermentation. Um, otherwise the carbonation is simply going to escape in the air. So, um, and if you didn't put anything on it at all, like I said, it would never carbonate. So you need a tightly sealed lid. Um, so again, I'm just gonna take these I could puree the, the, the fruits first, um, but I like to do sort of this rust, rustic style where I'm just taking the fruit, barely washing it, because again, I want to take some of the, all the yeast seeds and all the things that are you know, right from, the, from nature and utilize those. Um, and so I'm going to add, so the keys are adding a new sugar source, creating a tight seal. So I'm going to add loquats, but I also love, a, uh, using a, an herb and a fruit. So I've got lavender leaves. So this is culinary lavender. I'm going to add maybe a half a teaspoon of that. Um, kind of see it's just, just what it is, culinary lavender. Um, works great, makes an amazing aroma and, and, and a great flavor. It actually adds a little bit of um, a savoriness, almost like a rosemary, but without being like having to drink rosemary, you know. So, um, all right. So then I add just the, just the right amount of fruit, and then I top it up with mature, with basically kombucha that's been primary fermented, right? Um, so that's all I'm gonna do here. Uh, what were some of the questions, Drew? So, uh, yeah, so that's, that's Scobie Hotel. In, yeah, well, and you were talking about the, the carbonation, which is, which is great. So just like a recap is like the swing top, like a really tight seal on there, we'll get it a secondary um, source of sugar. So uh, some like cut up fruit or pureed fruit um, like you're, you're mentioning. Um, and then, yeah, we can talk about the SCOBY hotels. Uh, somebody did like a couple other questions. Um, yeah. So uh, Elizabeth, one Elizabeth just asked the herbs that you use, are they dried or fresh? Uh, the fruit, uh, the herbs were uh, dried, but I've also used them fresh too. So um, dried, you're going to need a lot less because they're more concentrated. Fresh, you could get away with uh, a few more. So I'll take a whole chamomile flower and just stuff it in there too. Um, so two more quick tips for uh, carbonation are to leave as little head space as possible in the bottle. So that's what I'm trying to do. It's a little bit harder to see because it's an opaque-ish bottle, but I uh, basically want to get the liquid to pretty close to the top of the neck of the bottle. And what that does is it, if there's no atmosphere, there's no air for where the carbonation can go. So it has nowhere to go, but into the liquid, which is really what carbonation is. So just get as little head space as possible. Um, and the final quick tip is if you don't, whether you do or do not want to add a, a new sugar source, ginger, which isn't very sweet, is known to create carbonation too. So, um, ginger is definitely, a, the, I, I would definitely say ginger is like a perfect hack. If you just want to make a bubbly kombucha and really don't care about the flavor, add the ginger to it and you'll almost guaranteed to get a bubbly kombucha um, out of it. Look at that. Right. Yeah, no I, see, I think you can kind of see it's pretty close. I could probably get another inch or so up there, but get as little head space as possible and uh, leave this at room temperature, the same temperature that you would brew regular kombucha at three or four days. And because this is a pressurized system now, if you're not sure if the weather's warm, take it every about day or so, go over a sink and just sort of like pop the bottle a little bit and you'll just see any excess carbonation. Uh, Will off gas. Um, just to, I just advocate to do that to be safe. Sometimes you'll get there and you'll just be like, oh, nothing happened. Well, that's better to be safe than to have a bottle bomb because this can become quite, you know, this is a force of nature that we're essentially curating. So um, just be respectful of that and don't, 
put put this on a hot in a hot shelf and, and two weeks later like oh gosh i need kombucha like then you call on the bomb squad then like then things get serious but that's an extreme example hopefully that doesn't happen to you um scoby hotel uh i have a scoby hotel that's five gallons right here just as long as you have enough liquid to cover everybody uh, and keep it happy you don't need to feed the scobies in the scoby hotel they're very sort of just chill again just don't let them dry out don't let bugs get in because uh, flies love um, kombucha probably more than we do um, <laughs> so it doesn't and you can you can cut you can put a lid on I've, I've had both jars with the lids on or just the, the, the same way that i would do active kombucha which is the cloth um, yeah it, again it, it's it's super resilient um, yeah just and you don't like i said you don't i've had scoby hotels where i've had the scobies in there in a shelf in the counter for a year brought them back out and they were fine. So just uh, not advocating that you do that, but it's, again, it's a very resilient um, uh, universe because that's really yeah. what it is. It's not. It's have not you ever, thing. have you ever added yeast to either the first fermentation or second fermentation or, or heard about that? Like a couple of people are asking Ann and Elizabeth or Ann and Jean were just asking about like um, some people have, they've heard other people add another type of yeast to the second fermentation um, for alcohol. Uh, yes. And then also somebody was saying, and was asking just like, does yeast help in help improve carbonation in the in the first fermentation? Um, so, if you're familiar with the new, there's a new category called high alcohol kombucha that's on the market. I don't know. I think uh, was it Art Kombucha in Canada is the yeah. brand. Yeah. Four four and a half five percent alcohol by volume. It's more like beer. Um, the methods to do that to coax more alcohol involve adding uh, additional yeast. So the yeasts that are just inherent in the kombucha scoby are not enough to get it to be that high because that's why kombucha naturally fermented is only about 0.5 to 1% alcohol by volume. So they pitch yeast, they pitch more sugar in, and then they make it in, I believe it's an anaerobic environment. And then what happens is the yeast then way outnumber the bacteria. They, may, they create a lot more ethanol before the bacteria can, can then metabolize it the way it would in, in homeostatic or homemade kombucha. So that's, that's the secret there. That's the trick to doing a naturally made high alcohol kombucha is to pitch more yeast. Champagne yeast is a good, is a good thing to start with. Um, and then, so it's essentially almost three fermentations. So you've got your primary to get your kombucha flavor. You pitch the yeast and the sugar secondary gets it, gets it amped up with alcohol. And then you can do a bottle conditioning or, or, I guess it's tertiary fermentation where you add the flavor. So um, I've only just dabbled with that. I've actually not been successful with it. The challenge that I have is uh, you need to, when you're pitching the yeast for that, for that alcohol fermentation, the pH of the kombucha has to be fairly high. But every time I try doing it, my pH dropped really fast within four or five days. And so, you know, to the point where if the, if the pH is too low, the yeast will not thrive. So it has to be somewhat, you know, there's, there's some variables involved in that. But um, as far as just doing it yeast for its own sake, uh, I haven't tried that without, unless I was trying to make high alcohol kombucha. So. Right. And those little yeast strings that we see on the, the SCOBY that kind of fall down, that's completely natural. And that's all right. Completely natural. They're called yeast dregs. You know, you can drink them. They're, they're fine. Um, if you are actually, if you're just when you're getting ready to dispense from primary to secondary, it's a good idea to stir the whole brew up because the yeasts do tend to hang out at the bottom and the bacteria tend to hang out at the top. So if you want a brew that's uh, uniform, stir it up before you dispense it or before you drink it. Um, and also, if your scoby gets those dregs on them, it's okay to just kind of like get rid of them because you do still want to keep a again a balance of the bacteria and the yeast. Cool. Well, let's do one last question from Gabby and then we'll, um, we'll wrap up. Um, so Gabby was just asking, which is kind of a good finish is talk about the timeline. So you just spent a little bit making kombucha. So you've got a, a brew that's going to be brewing there. And then you also have a, one that's bottled. So what's the timing from what's in the, um, the ceramic crock to when it gets to the second fermentation to then when can you actually drink your um, fruit infused kombucha? Yeah, great. So uh, I would say that it does vary with the seasons and with the ambient temperature in your in your house. Uh, seven to 21 days. I've rarely seen it happen as fast as seven days. So let's just say 14 days. 
after the seventh day is when I'll probably start to come in and just taste it and say, okay, this tastes, this still tastes like sweet tea or you know, this kind of tastes like a sweet kombucha. So basically just taste it every f few days just to see what happens. And it's a one way street. It goes from tea all the way to vinegar and you stop it whenever you, whenever you like it. So the tartness sweetness combination is completely up to you. But when you do like the flavor of it, um, like when you would drink it or maybe when it's a tad bit sweeter, that's when you just, you can decide to put it into the secondary. Um, so say 14 days primary, put it into a secondary. And then this is for me another three to seven days. Uh, and that varies again, depending on the ambient temperature. Also depends on how fizzy you like it, how tart you like it. Um, th but three, three to four days is an average for the secondary fermentation. Then uh, when, it's, when it's done, when you let's say you, you pop it and you're like, oh, that's fizzy, I like it, chill it. Um, it's gonna be a lot better to drink uh, chilled. Cool. And, then, and, uh, and then you just leave them, and then you just leave them in the fridge, um, like you make from a like when I make a one gallon um, batch, I probably get yeah like three or four bottles depending on the size of the flip top bottles, and I just leave them in the fridge um, after that like three to four days of second fermentation, and then just kind of I leave them in the fridge, and then once I'm ready to drink them, I drink them, but they stay in the fridge once it's um, after those three to four days. They stay in the fridge absolutely, and it depends on. Um, in my experience, widely varies on how stable in the fridge it is. So what I mean is I've had, uh, uh, let's say just, well, plain kombucha will, will stay for maybe one or two months. And then eventually it will still, uh, it will still ferment very slowly in the refrigerator. I call the refrigerator uh, fermentation super slow-mo because it doesn't stop it, but it, it, it dramatically slows it. So it will continue to develop. Um, I've also had things in the summer like water, where that make watermelon mint which are both very ephemeral. So even after three weeks of putting it in the fridge, I've tasted the, wa I've tasted the watermelon mint and it's just like, oh, this isn't very good. So, so the, again, because the sugars are still being metabolized out. So depending on what ingredients you're using, they're a little bit more stable once they're in the fridge. But I would say um, more than a month is probably, it's gonna start to get a little old. Yeah, that's great. Um, well, that's exciting. I wish I could be there to, um taste that kombucha because unfortunately I don't think we get that wonderful type of um, produce here in in Canada well, I mean especially where I am anyway I know we've chatted before about some different flavors and that sort of thing and I was always jealous of um, of what what you get and what's in season and not in season for you so it's that's cool that you um, get that and thanks thanks again for joining the virtual kombucha brew party um we got a lot going on this week but this was super helpful i know we didn't get a chance to really have any gateway and talk about other ferments but maybe we'll shelve that for another conversation um where can we find more about fermenters club and um what's how, how can we find you or interact with you um outside of just the virtual kombucha brew party yes cool thanks for for uh doing that so um can you guys see the the screen? My, yeah. So basically, uh, just a quick, the, what the club is, and there's different ways to, uh, this is an older slide, shoot. Um, all right, so you can go online, of course, for membersclub.com, all the social media, Instagram, uh, Facebook. I also have started doing online courses. Um, so for Mentors Club Academy, so we've got one, a, a comprehensive one about kombucha, a comprehensive one on kimchi, I'm building another one about sourdough bread. Um, so look for those. Um, also, the idea of creating actual communities in, P in all around the world is something that I've been uh, working on. I've been fostering it here where I live and just building the template so that somebody like Drew, if you wanted to start a, a chapter in your town, basically it would be a fermenters club chapter where you basically what we do is we get together about every month or so. Everybody brings what they made. We, we do food swap. We share. We have fun. Now, mind you, this was made in the pre-COVID world. So um, who knows what, what we'll need to do in order to evolve. But um, I still think this is a, a powerful way for people to meet and to connect. So if, if you are interested at all in um, leading a Fermenters Club chapter in your part of the world, there's a link on the website that you can just fill out a short app and then you know, let me know what your interest is and I'll, I'll get back to you guys. Um, yeah, YouTube channel, uh, chapters, I do curate festivals, but again, that probably won't happen this year. Um, and that's the way to get a hold of us. Again, Facebook, Instagram, 
Pinterest, uh, YouTube channel are all the ways to stay in touch. And I just started a new series called 15 Minute Ferments, which I'm trying to establish a regular schedule. And that's just a YouTube live stream where kind of similar to this format, I just show you how to do something real quick. And then you guys can chat, ask questions. And of course it will be available for replay. So that's about all on my spiel. That's great. Um, I, just, I added a link to the um, to your website in the chat so people can can check it out and um, yeah, check out the, the Facebook, Instagram, all the socials and that sort of thing. And yeah, j definitely jump into that 15 minute ferments. I think that's a great idea because it's just, again, these are great intros to, to fermentation and it doesn't have to be complex and complicated. It is because it is a science and chemistry and biology and everything. But the cool thing is, is that fermenting is tons of fun. It's easy to do and it's very approachable in terms of, um, cooking and, and food and it's it's good for you and it's a nice nice community so um yeah i appreciate having you austin uh thanks everybody for joining again we'll be back tomorrow at at 3 p.m with um a team from mananova from montreal they're gonna be talking about um, more kombucha and commercial kombucha and scaling kombucha and that sort of thing so it'll be a really neat chat so come by there and then obviously and then like i mentioned on wednesday we um are having Bill Shipper, the uh, singer of Kombucha Cutie. He'll be joining us for a live concert. So feel free to share the link with your friends and family um, and during that time. Thanks again, everybody. She's Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Make tea. There's a fungus in there somehow. The sugar for the alcohol. And it all fits her personality. And she's a kombucha cutie, kind of tangy, kind of fruity. She's bright and bubbly, sassy and free. Kombucha cutie, my favorite foodie. She's a female fermenting for men like me. She keeps it covered and hidden, like a fruit forbidden. All the more mysterious, to say the least. There's a squishy little scoby, scoby Juan Kenobi. Symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast. She's a kombucha cutie, kind of tangy, kind of fruity. She's bright and bubbly, sassy and free. Kombucha cutie, my favorite foodie. Female fermenting for men like